Again, hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence webinar series brought to you by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with Stephen Ward on the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the latter portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Michael Ard, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome everyone. Happy New Year uh, to Inside Intelligence. And today our guest is Stephen Ward, who worked as an intelligence officer for nearly 30 years with the Central Intelligence Agency, covering Middle East, South Asian, and related national security issues. He served as a deputy national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia on the National Intelligence Council from 2005 to 2006, and as a director of intelligence programs for the National Security Council from 1998 to 1999. Stephen is the author of Immortal, A Military History of Iran and Its Armed Forces, from Georgetown University Press, 2014, and Iran's Ministry of Intelligence, A Concise History, forthcoming from Georgetown University Press. He currently works as a contract historian for the Joint Chiefs of Staff Joint History and Research Office, where he is preparing volumes 16 and 17 of the Classified History series, The Joint Chiefs of Staff and National Policy, covering the George W. Bush administration. Steve, thank you very much for being here with us. We've been looking forward to this discussion today on the Iran Revolutionary Guard and the axis of resistance. So over to you. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, having me. I'm uh, very pleased to be here to talk about these issues. Um, I'm going to try to go through things fairly briefly in order to leave as much time as possible for uh, the students and others uh, to have uh, questions uh, in, the, in the other part of the presentation. Um, what I thought I'd do to start is that because this webinar series is about analysis, uh, I was going to use some of my recent work on the Joint Chiefs to uh, set up a framework for my presentation. Uh, now, this story involves, in the very early days of the George W. Bush administration, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, uh, who uh, in his uh, confirmation hearings and when he first got to the Pentagon, he consistently stressed to the chiefs and the joint staff that uh, surprise was inevitable and that they had to be prepared to deal with surprise and that to do that, they had to deal with uncertainty and that involved challenging underlying and uh, assumptions, especially for intelligence. And as a matter of fact, in one of his very first meetings with the chiefs in the tank, uh, he came in and he asked them to read Thomas Schelling's introduction to Roberta Wollstetler, excuse me, Roberta Wollstetler's uh, seminal 1963 work, Pearl Harbor, Warning and Decision. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he was so intent on it, the next day he sent them each a copy of the introduction. Not satisfied with that, a couple of months later to ensure they read it, at another tank meeting, he brought copies of the introduction and distributed them to the chiefs. So uh, he wanted to make sure that he got the message or that they got the message. And uh, I'm going to come back to Shelling later because I actually think it's an introduction that's uh, worth reading by just about everybody who works in analysis. Anyway, Rumsfeld's main point was that unreviewed, outdated, and inappropriate assumptions can lead to perfectly logical but outdated and inappropriate conclusions and that if you get the assumptions right, everything else follows. Um, and he wasn't wrong about that, although and this is another story. His secretary actually wasn't very good at overcoming his own mindset and bias problems, uh, but uh, he did make it a personal hallmark to challenge assumptions, and uh, he used his view of the spectrum of uncertainty, which I'm sure some of you have heard, that I think is helpful and I'm going to use today. And that spectrum is, is that there are known knowns, that is to say things that we know we know, and there are known unknowns, the things that we've identified that we don't know, or at least that we need to know more about. And then finally, there are unknown unknowns, the things that we haven't 
thought of yet. And maybe that's the realm where genuine surprise actually exists. Anyway, I'm going to kind of follow that uh, template to talk about the RGC and the axis of resistance. Um, so let me start with the known knowns. Uh, again, these are generally observable or confirmed information, which uh, still may be subject to different interpretations. But in Iran's case, I think things like Iran's national security goals, which lead to its use of the axis of resistance, the RGC strategy to achieve these goals by using the axis of resistance, and uh, things like uh, the ARO or the axis members, their role and their general capabilities, these are pretty well understood. So Iran's strategic objectives uh, come from the fact that the regime has long believed that the US dominated international system creates an unfavorable balance of power that undermines and isolates the regime. So their security policies, not surprisingly, uh, focus on minimizing threats to their existence and internal stability, to expanding their influence, usually by doing it at the cost of eroding American influence, and then to project power in the Middle East. But for the most part, the Iranians have remained on the strategic defensive because they want to avoid provoking a direct conflict with the United States. And if conflict should come, they would actually prefer it to occur outside Iranian territory, which again is why they put so much emphasis on supporting the axis of resistance. Now, the IRGC's part of this is to take those strategic goals and turn it into a defensive strategy and military doctrine that works to deter Iran's enemies and, uh, and to basically make Iran as uh, undigestible as possible so that uh, countries don't want to attack it. Now, they do that by using uh, hybrid warfare and asymmetric operations, primarily using capabilities that they were able to develop over the past couple of decades by uh, doing things that didn't require a lot of foreign support. Again, Iran's mostly isolated, has few allies, and uh, you know can't count on arms suppliers. So uh, they focused on missiles and rockets, drones, and you know in some places like in Iraq, improvised explosive devices to try and uh, do their work. Uh, and of course, a big part of that is is they set up uh, basically a deterrent strategy that involved this triad of the ballistic missile threat. Um, their ability to interfere with uh, the flow of energy supplies out of the Persian Gulf region, which impacts the international economy and gives most countries a stake in what happens uh, with regard to Iran. And then finally, uh, the use of the axis of resistance, as it's come to be called, uh, to uh, project power and to serve as a deterrent uh, by basically threatening uh, Iran's neighbors, whether it's Israel, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf states, and of course, U.S. forces in the region. Initially, and I think most people are probably aware of this, and certainly if you've been following the news, you're, you're up to date on the axis of resistance, but just briefly, you know, it started out with, uh, in the 1980s with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, when Hamas was formed in the late 1980s, the Iranians saw advantage in supporting them uh, to tie down the Israelis and have something to threaten the Israelis with. Uh, over the past couple of decades after uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, the Iraqi groups that they had been nurturing inside Iran since the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, they were able to send back into Iraq uh, and, and form the basis not only of political factions there, but uh, various militias that now operate in the country. And then uh, with uh, the a Syrian civil war in the starting around uh, 2011, 2012, and uh, then later the the war in Yemen. Uh, they've added Syria, Syrian militias, and uh, Ansarallah or the Houthis in Yemen uh, to the axis of resistance. Um, and of course, uh, the Iranians very open about uh, their support to each of these groups. Uh, all the groups are fairly open about crediting Iran with their support. So in terms of known knowns, uh, we have an idea of who the members are. We have an idea of their basic capabilities because they've demonstrated most of it. And uh, more importantly, uh, I think we can uh, conclude that Iran and the IRGC in particular, uh, especially its Quds Force unit, which basically runs the show with uh, the support, training, and arming of the Axis of Resistance, uh, is a very effective means to deter Iran's enemies. Uh, because you have these partners who, despite 
not really being all that similar, uh, all share an interest in protecting Iran as a means to advance their own interest in the region. Okay, with that, uh, let me go to the known unknowns, uh, which are probably more important. Uh, again, known unknowns doesn't really mean there's an absence of knowledge. Uh, I actually kind of think of them as these are the basis of all our collection requirements, um, that uh, we know enough to know we need to know more. And uh, it's an area of uncertainty too, where this is where assumptions really come into a play, because when we don't have that information, we have to uh, substitute the assumptions. I think the most un important known unknown, uh, particularly for US policymakers, is uh, what is the level of Iranian direction uh, and support to the axis of resistance axis of resistance. Um, I think the other known unknowns, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them, is uh, just how uh, the Axis members' intentions are involving and what is the current state of their self-interest and constraints on their actions. And then finally, uh, just what is the Axis's true red lines for escalating the war? Let me talk about Iranian direction first. Um, this is a... Um, really one of those more controversial known unknowns because there are a lot of different ways to interpret what we do know and, and to read the things that we don't know. Um, Iran and all the Axis members consistently maintain that uh, each enjoys agency and autonomy. That is that they're not Iran's puppets, they're not Iran's proxies. Uh, they work with Iran, they're supported with Iran. They're aligned to various degrees with Iranian interest, uh, but uh, they don't follow Iran's directions. Uh, I tend to come down on the side that that's probably true, that historically Iran has been much more reactive than proactive when uh, crises and events erupt in the Middle East. Uh, rather than initiate events, Iran more often than not just opportunistically takes advantage of the situations instigated by others uh, and uh, historically, the Iranians and the Guard through the Quds Force have uh, tried to keep the level of involvement and intervention unclear. Uh, this gives them a certain amount of uh, plausible deniability when things uh, get nasty and uh, gives them some distance uh, uh, when uh, their uh, partners in the Axis uh, have setbacks. Uh, I think because obviously the IRGC supports these groups and, and you know actually publicizes it, uh, Iran retains some culpability when Axis members uh, take actions such as uh, Gaza's attack on uh, October 7th against Israel. Uh, but uh, I think uh, you know just judging from what we've been reading in the papers, you know people need to be careful about attributing all developments to some sort of specific grand Iranian plan for the region. That, uh, uh, I personally just don't think that exists and that, uh, that again, the Iranians are opportunistic in how they use the axis. When it comes to Iranian support, again, the Iranians brag a whole lot about what they've done with uh, providing training, uh, technology and know-how to how to build missiles and rockets and other things that they do. Uh, but for the most part, we rely on estimates of how much financial support goes to the groups uh, and how large their weapon inventories are. These are areas where more precise knowledge would help to judge uh, how durable and resilient the Axis are, uh, and particularly their ability in a situation such as now when they're uh, consuming a lot of their own inventories is to, uh, you know, just how quickly they can replace uh, lost equipment and weapons. Uh, another uh, Known unknown that I mentioned was just uh, access intentions and what I call interest and constraints, which I'm not going to say a lot about, just to make sure you're aware of them. Uh, their hyperbole and their secrecy obscures a lot of what it is they intend to do. And uh, because there are a lot of variables involved in their interest and the constraints, it's it's difficult to judge just what their impact will be. But uh, you know, the one thing is that while the Axis is acting collaboratively, and uh, Axis leaders are openly talking about meeting and 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 collaborate and cooperating with each other in operation centers and things like that. Um, this is actually the first crisis that we've had where the coalition has actually mobilized on mo multiple fronts at the same time to strike at U.S. and Israeli interests. So we're right now in the period I think of of learning a lot about how the Axis operates. Um, 
I think uh, too, uh, we saw a little bit of Axis cohesion and when they stopped operations uh, last November during the ceasefire, when they were uh, uh, Hamas and Israel were negotiating the hostage release. Um, and uh, we also see, I think, some cohesion in that with the possible exception of the Houthis, most of the Axis members are being very careful not to do something that unintentionally escalates the conflict and uh, and causes the Israelis of the U.S. to to take really serious actions against them. Uh, I think the unknown part in this area, though, is just how far each group might go in following Iran's lead or taking actions that they really prefer not to, but you know, are doing it because Iran would like them to do it. Uh, uh, historically, there's just really few cases where Iran's been in a position to ask that type of thing of the. Uh, Axis members. And uh, we know in some cases, uh, occasionally they do say no. Uh, Houthis in particular seem least constrained by the Iranians and actually have been the most critical uh, of the Axis members uh, complaining about what Hezbollah and Iran have done in response to Gaza. And uh, uh, they're a bit of a wild card, uh, as some U.S. officials have called them, in terms of how they respond. And then uh, finally on known unknowns is just this idea of red line. We've had almost all of the commanders of the Axis members come out and say that uh, there were red lines where they'd be willing to escalate. But uh, the initial red line was an Israeli ground invasion of Gaza and, and, and not much happened. And then uh, uh, they'd also said, well, if Israel continues indiscriminate bombing of Gaza, uh, that was a red line. Uh, not much has happened. Uh, U.S. intervention, which depending upon how you want to parse things, I think you could say the U.S. has intervened uh, just with uh, its uh, operations against the Houthis. Uh, yeah, that was a red line and not much has happened. Uh, uh, this is all a long way of saying is that uh, it's quite possible that the Axis and Iran uh, understand their limits, do not want to escalate and are going to try to control things. Uh, but it's really hard to rule out that there might be some level of Israeli action, uh, the actual elimination of Hamas, if that were to happen, or, uh, you know, some really horrible catastrophic event in Gaza that would cause the Axis to decide, no, now is the time to escalate, if only to maintain our reputation. Uh, and then my final thoughts on are going to cover the unknown unknowns, which is sort of hard to talk about because once you identify it, it becomes a, a known unknown. Uh, but uh, it is worth taking some time in a crisis like this to uh, think about those high impact, low probability events that uh, are plausible and could happen. Um, uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, two things that came to my mind that I haven't heard a lot of people or if any people talk about is that uh, uh, you know, given what we've seen of just the physical destruction of Gaza that, uh, uh, you know, might one or more of the Axis members uh, uh, feel the need to conduct some type of mass casualty attack against an Israeli city, uh, either by a missile salvo or, uh, you know, again, thinking outside the box, there are chemical weapons in Syria that may or may not be that well uh, controlled uh, that uh, could possibly work their way into some sort of attack alternately uh, maybe respond to Gaza's destruction with some type of uh, a kinetic or cyber attack on uh, uh, counter value targets such as water, fuel, or power supplies, which uh, we've already seen smaller versions of these attacks on both sides. So uh, Iran had some difficulty a couple of weeks ago with uh, uh, their supply of, uh, of getting gasoline to consumers because of their network of subsidized gasoline uh, there was a cyber attack that made it impossible to fill, you know, for Iranians to fill up their cars. Anyway, I, I think it's important to continue to worry about uh, the possible expansion of the conflict and, and have some out-of-the-box thinking to, to discuss that. Uh, and that uh, brings me back to Thomas Schelling, because that was his message, uh, uh, that sometimes we get so busy thinking about obvious adversary moves that we neglect to hedge against the choice that they ultimately make. Um, he also warned about the need to avoid the tendency to confuse the unfamiliar with the improbable. And I think whether you're talking about Pearl Harbor, 9-11, uh, or uh, the Al-Aqsa storm operation, uh, that's uh, pretty good advice uh, when you're thinking about what might happen next. 
uh, going a little bit longer than I had planned to, but I do want to offer a, a few final thoughts about the IRGC and the Axis. Uh, for Iran and the IRGC, the most important thing about the Axis relationship is it permits them to intervene in regional conflicts to protect Iran's interest at relatively low cost, and as I mentioned earlier, with some plausible deniability. Uh, Axis member operations, especially in Syria and more recently in Gaza, uh, have created opportunities for Tehran to uh, uh, gain greater diplomatic and other cooperation from Russia and China, uh, while at the same time, uh, these conflicts tend to strain U.S. relations with Arab countries in the region, in the region and that, uh, that helps Iran. Um, I think uh, Hamas's surprise attack and the Axis's demonstrated cohesion over the past few months uh, is a major win for the alliance because uh, it demonstrated that uh, uh, they can work together and that uh, you know there's a reason why they are a deterrent threat. And I think more importantly right now is that it has harmed Israelis' sense of security and uh, you know that could influence them for many years to come. And then finally, from Tehran's point of view, uh, the conflict uh, currently is helping Iranian interests by uh, stopping at least temporarily the Saudi-Israeli normalization. Uh, it's reducing Iran's isolation because Iranian support for Sunni Palestinian kind of undercuts the narrative that Iranian is just about promoting Shiism at Sunni expense. Uh, it seems to be helping encourage anti-Israeli and anti-U.S. sentiment around the world. Uh, some of you might be aware that uh, South Africa is taking Israel up for the International Court of Justice uh, for alleged genocide. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that really hurts reputations. And then finally, you know, at, at, at least one level, it's consuming a lot of Israeli and U.S. resources and intention that otherwise might be directed at Iran and uh the folks in Tehran are probably very appreciative of that. Uh, Michael, I'm going to stop there and, and, and open it up to questions. Thanks, Steve. I have a couple, and uh, thank, uh, that was a great overview. And uh, one of the things I'd like to ask is, um, so you were, you, the picture you're presenting here is Iran that is opportunistic and really defensive-minded. Oftentimes we see in the press, it's referred, we, you'll see words referred to like Middle East hegemony, striving for Middle East hegemony and things like that. Um, what do you, how do you respond to that? Does that fit with what your analysis is? Uh, the, yeah, again, uh, I, I think Iran is, is much more reactive and uh, they have over decades now with the Axis set themselves up to where they're much more influential, they're much more capable of projecting power um, to the extent that all countries desire to exert a certain amount of influence, if not hegemony, uh, the, the Iranians are like that. Uh, I don't see them necessarily in that situation though, in large part because the United States is still there uh, and uh, Iran is isolated. Uh, uh, it has a lot of problems at home and a number of weaknesses. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Axis alliance doesn't always work at Iran's direction. And uh, uh, but, you know, some influence is influence and it's important and it's helpful to Iran. So uh, uh, in, in that regard, uh, I think uh, the Iranians uh, are achieving a lot of their goals. But again, as I mentioned, they are mostly on the strategic defensive. Uh, you know, they're not trying to conquer. They're not trying to uh, direct, uh, even if they could, a lot of the countries. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks talk about, oh, the Iranians are in control of Baghdad and Sana'a mm -hmm. and Beirut and uh, Damascus. And, you know, and it's nonsense. They don't. And even if they did, you know, you have to think about, well, what does that mean? Uh, uh, Iraq, God knows, has a lot of problems. Damascus is recovering from civil war and is not doing well. Yemen is divided still and faces a humanitarian crisis. And Lebanon is, uh, you know, suffering severe economic problems and hasn't had a functioning government in a long time. So uh, in terms of who controls what in the Middle East and who can project power and influence there, 
Iran's still playing with a very weak hand. One thing I wonder about is, uh, of course, the IRGC's uh, uh, branch that controls or has the most in influence with these groups is the Quds Force. And so something of their special forces, right? Yes. Um, since uh, Soleimani was uh, killed by our drone strike in 2020, um, how have we had an assessment on how much that's influenced um, the Quds Force to greatest capabilities, changed its strategy? Any sense of what that might have, the impact that may have had? Uh, from an open source side, I, I can't say for sure. There are a lot of people who follow the Quds Force closely and... Uh, um, you know, I think uh, while there might have been some hiccups early after Ismail Ghani took over from Soleimani, mm -hmm. that uh, it, it doesn't seem to have missed much and that they're back in stride. And, and uh, I think the challenge for the Quds Force right now is that with all their allies, again, consuming a lot of their resources, is that uh, how quickly and how well will they be able to to rebuild uh, those inventories and, uh, and and you know keep the deterrent threat as robust as it has been in the past, uh, um, you know they're going to face a challenge uh, of to whatever eventually happens to Hamas and the Pal other Palestinian militant groups. Uh, you know my guess is, is that uh, Hamas, if not eliminated, will probably rebuild. It may take a long time. Uh, uh, but if it is eliminated, it will be replaced by other Palestinian militants. And, uh, you know, the challenge for Iran would be, and the Quds Force, rather, as, as the arm that makes all this happen, will be, you know, okay, how do we help them build and become as capable and and, and potent as Hamas was? And, uh, and it'll be tougher. Uh, it was a lot easier for the Iranians to smuggle stuff into Gaza than it has been to smuggle stuff into West Bank, but they are smuggling stuff into the West Bank. So, uh, you know, they do have options down the road. One um, one question I've had was on, uh, you know, the, the um, negotiation between the Saudis and Iran over, um, over uh, the Houthi war. This was brokered by China. Um, Houthis are now in the news, of course. They're, you know, whether or not, do, do you think this could mean that this is this uh, negotiation has broken down? Um, it's a little outside my writ, uh, okay. but uh, All right. uh, my sense is, at least on the Iranian side, is that, uh, you know, since uh, the war started last October in Gaza, the, you know, they've uh, improvements with the Saudis, their relations with the Saudis has actually improved. The Iranian President Raisi has uh, talked to Saudi leaders. Uh, uh, they've, uh, they have they went to a joint or a, a combined meeting of Arab governments to uh, talk about uh, a solution to the Palestinian problem. Uh, so if anything, uh, it, it doesn't yet seem to have affected the impact. Uh, and right now, uh, I think the Houthis would like to maintain that ceasefire with the Saudis, but, uh, um, and this goes to, you know, again, sort of the difference between the members of the axis of resistance. The Houthis are attacking Israel and, and shipping in the Red Sea right now, uh, not because Iran asked them to, but because uh, going back decades, the Houthis have always been very closely tied to the Palestinians and supportive of uh, the Palestinians' objective of uh, creating, you know, their own separate state or, and fighting Israel. And, uh, you know, that goes back even before the Houthis took over uh, their portion of uh, Yemen. Uh, and uh, I think the Houthis probably, that's one of the constraints. They want to be careful what they're doing, that they don't undermine the possibility of finalizing a deal with the Saudis. But uh, right now, they seem more interested in building up their reputation uh, at home as a defender of Palestinians and with the, in the larger Arab and Muslim community uh, as a defender of Palestinians. It also is a nice contrast for the Houthis with uh, the uh, internationally recognized government of Yemen, which the Saudis support, uh, which, uh, as far as I know, has said and done next to nothing with regard to the Palestinians.
last sort of outside the box question in the spirit of uh, uh, your unknown unknowns, like or no known unknowns, but is you know given that this is going on in the Red Sea, um, would what would it take for the Iran to say, well, and this was probably being led by the IRGC, I would assume, is uh, well maybe making moves to uh, close the Strait of Hormuz, either in solidarity or just. Or, as, or in terms of just ratcheting up the pressure on the West? Uh, well, the Iranians are already targeting Israeli shipping in and around uh, the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, and and uh, the Houthi threats in the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandab passage uh, that um, they're are generally geared towards Israeli shipping or Israeli-related shipping. So... Um, I think they'll be content to do that. I also saw recently that uh, the Iranians are sending some ships to the Red Sea as kind of a show of support to the Houthis. Um, actually, actually doing something to affect uh, energy flows out of the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, that's part of that overall protect Iran deterrent <laughs> that they have. So that's kind of a used in extremis uh, because uh, it's always... As part of their deterrent, it's there. It certainly, I think, influences the Europeans and countries in Asia to uh, advise the United States to be cautious because they don't want to have a major part of their oil flows to be cut off. But it's also one of those things like you don't want to uh, use uh, unless you have to because one, it affects Iranian oil flows and, and two, uh, uh, you know, it causes people to find other sources of oil. Uh, I'd also mention, I mean, one of the advantages the Houthis provide to the Iranians is that uh, over years, because of the Iranian threat to this, the Strait of Hormuz, the Saudis built pipelines and did other things to move their oil uh, out of the Strait, uh, out of the Persian Gulf. And so they now ship a lot of their oil uh, far outside the Strait of Hormuz. So it's not as vulnerable to the Iranians. And having the Houthis on side uh, gives the Iranians assuming the Houthis will follow their direction, a chance to threaten oil flows outside of the Persian Gulf. But uh, anyway, short answer is, uh, I, I think they'd be reluctant to use it in the current crisis because uh, uh, I think they want to maintain that deterrent. One, uh, uh, some questions now from our audience and um, thanks for all your questions and uh, we'll be here till the, the top of the hour uh, to answer them for you. But uh, one, Jim asked a few questions about um, uh, the IRGC. One is in terms of its development, and this is you know your Bailey with Steve from uh, your book. And what when do we really see um, the IRGC taking on this uh, international role? And um, you know how is it? You know how important has it been in terms of its uh, prominence in the Iranian state? Uh, well, at the, almost from the start, the IRGC has has played a role in trying to spread, uh, you know, what's sometimes referred to as Khomeiniism or uh, the, the you know the pan-Islamic theology that Ayatollah Khomeini uh, uh, created uh, at the very start of the Iranian Revolution uh, back in 1979. So uh, they had an Office of Liberation Movements in the early 1980s where. Um, uh, the IRGC, which had actually kind of grown up with uh, uh, the PLO in Lebanon and uh, and and uh, had drawn some of its inspiration from the the various uh, leftist Marxist movements in Europe and and elsewhere in the 1970s. Uh, so uh, you know, just from the very beginning, they they started supporting revolutionary movements uh, and and particularly Shia revolutionary movements. Uh, by the mid 1980s, uh, they had helped create Lebanese Hezbollah, and it really started to create the model that they started to follow elsewhere. And as I mentioned earlier, when Hamas was founded in the late 1980s, uh, uh, again you have these groups that are anti-U.S. or anti-Israel can serve Iran's interests. They start to build them up. Uh, and and for a while, it was just Hamas and uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. Following 9-11 and the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq, then they were able to create the their Iraqi element of the axis. 
Syrian civil war led to uh, creating uh, new groups there. And, uh, you know, really they seemed to get better and better at it as they went along uh, with uh, developing ways to train. Uh, the Iranians uh, made a lot of use of Lebanese Hezbollah as trainers because as Arabs, the Lebanese Hezbollah trainers, uh, you know, could work better with the Iraqis and with the Yemenis than the Persian Iranians could. So uh, it, it's been a long time effort of the guard. Uh, it does not contribute to their popularity at home. Uh, uh, Iranians are quite clear about, uh, uh, or at least uh, a lot of Iranians are very unhappy about uh, Iran spending so much treasure on foreign uh, adventures and uh, they complain about it. But then there are occasions like when uh, the IRGC was fighting against ISIS in Iraq where they, uh, they uh, actually improved their popularity, particularly uh, uh, Quds Force and Soleimani uh, uh, for you know fighting against these Sunni extremists who posed a threat to Iran. Getting back to this idea of the axis of resistance, when did we start seeing that term used? Uh, I, not until the latter part of the 2010s, uh, you know, maybe maybe earlier, but uh, I retired from CIA at the end of 2014, and I actually don't recall us using it all that much back then, uh, if at all. So, uh, uh, but certainly by the time uh, the Syrian civil war got really going, uh, uh, that came in. Uh, but the whole concept of resistance is, is part of that Iranian ideology that uh, uh, going back to the Iranian revolution where uh, they were outside of the international order, uh, you know, they used to talk about they were neither East nor West during the Cold War and that they were resisting what they felt was an unfair international order that uh, uh, hurt uh, what they called the dispossessed and the, the oppressed and that uh, the Iranian revolution was actually there to protect those people by going against, uh, you know, the powers that be at the time. Another question we have on, uh, does the IRGC see the ultimate demise of Israel as its realistic goal? They, or, is, or do they plan to leverage bilateral relations with Russia and China to help them achieve that goal? Um, personally, I would say no. Uh, it's part of their rhetoric. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an aspiration, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, just based on what they've been willing to do, uh, they don't seem like they're going to devote a lot of time and energy themselves to try to destroy Israel. And they have longer time frames than we do. So I think they're content to think that Israel itself is going to uh, be the source of its own demise. And, and, uh, and uh, but they're happy for ideological reasons, and, as well as their own self interest to support uh, what they see as a, a national liberation movement uh, by the Palestinian militants uh, to uh, uh, weaken and distract and tie down Israel and keep Israel away from uh, its activities against Iran. Uh, the Iranians are all over the place politically as far as um, just since October, officials have said, you know, we're, we don't think there's this two, two state solution. You know, Israel basically has to go away. Uh, and uh, then they turn around and they say, but, you know, we'll agree with whatever the Palestinians agree to. And we kind of support the Saudi proposal for a two state solution. Uh, uh, I think uh, realistically, as long as, uh, uh, the Israelis uh, and the Palestinians could forge some agreement uh, and it didn't threaten any severe, you know, it didn't threaten Iranian interest, uh, you know, they'd be content with whatever was decided. Uh, thanks. Scott asks about um, the Houthis attacking U.S. shipping or, or international shipping, I should say, and um, is uh, wonders if Iran has been involved in helping them uh, uh, doing their targeting. Um, you suggested earlier that uh, this is sort of the Houthis acting on their own. I would I would surmise that if Iran was helping with their target, helping them with targeting, we don't have a lot to worry about. 
<laughs> but anyway, what do you think? Is there are they are they hands on with this, or is this here's some? And in fact, I don't know if they've even been getting any more uh, weapons from them for the last couple of years. Um, yeah, the uh, the Houthis uh, credit Iran with helping them with weapons and and helping them gain the skills and technology to build their own weapons. Uh, I think they still rely on Iran for materials to build weapons. I don't think they have uh, that capability. Uh, the Houthis uh, pretended to be offended by the accusation that Iran was directing their attacks, uh, saying, you know, what, you don't think we know how to do this? Uh, that said, uh, from what I've read in the papers, U.S. officials say, yeah, we're pretty sure the Iranians uh, help uh, the Houthis direct their attacks. So I'm going to go with the U.S. officials and say that the Iranians do help. Uh, I don't think the Iranians direct the attack. Uh, the Houthis uh, uh, have their own reasons for uh, for threatening U.S. Uh, shipping and U.S. Navy ships uh, uh, in, in this instance. So one, because the U.S. Navy ship is intervening in this fight with Israel. Uh, they're there to protect Israeli shipping. Uh, so the Houthis probably feel free to attack them then, but, uh, you know, again, they don't need the Iranians to tell them not like the United States. They have their own reasons because the U.S. support to the Saudis and the Emiratis during the Yemen war. Uh, if you go back further, uh, after 9-11, uh, the U.S. Uh, supported the former Yemeni government and some of its operations, or at least the, the Houthis perceived that the U.S. was supporting Yemen and attacking uh, the Houthis uh, back in the early part of the century. And uh, even before that, uh, some of the U.S. Uh, role in support of Israel against the Palestinians uh, uh, went against the Houthis' uh, interest, or at least their perceived interest in supporting the Palestinians. So uh, uh, they don't need Iranian direction, but yeah, they'll accept Iranian help. What do you think, of asked a question from Jim, um... Is their Iran or the IRGC view of the Hamas uh, October attack? Uh, what do you think their view on this is now uh, that we've been in, in, into the response now for a few months? Um, obviously, they see it as something maybe initially beneficial in helping derail the uh, Jerusalem Accords. But after that, what? I mean, if this leads to destruction of Hamas, uh, they can't be too happy about that. Um. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I guess I concluded with sort of what I thought were the Iranian wins in this particular situation. The Iranian losses uh, thus far is uh, probably more long-term in, in that, um, as I said, each of their militias, parts of the axis of resistance have problems at home. And uh, uh, some of this will probably reflect back on them, uh, Lebanon in particular, uh, Hezbollah, as I understand, has been under a lot of pressure to not do anything that would, you know, cause a replay of the 2006 war where Lebanon suffered so badly from uh, the fighting. Uh, you know, similarly, as we were talking earlier, the Houthis do have some concern about maintaining their ceasefire and getting some kind of final arrangement. And, and even in Iraq, uh, where the Shia militias seem to be using the crisis to get the government there to actually try and push the U.S. military out of uh, the country. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of people in, in Iraq who are going to be unhappy that uh, the militias had that opportunity, and uh, they all have long memories. Uh, losing Hamas is a problem. I, I think I touched on briefly, uh, but um, there are other Palestinian militant groups uh, they can rebuild, they can rearm. And uh, while you do lose that Palestinian front against Israel, you still have the Syrian front and the northern Lebanese front, and you still have the Houthis who are able to fire missiles into Israel. So you lose some of your deterrent, but not a lot. And uh, uh, I think uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, I don't know if people are aware of it, but uh, when the Syrian civil war initially started, uh, Hamas actually sided against Damascus uh, in uh, solidarity with Sunni Syrians. So there was a period there uh, for several years where Hamas was not part of the axis of resistance. And, uh, you know, as long as the Palestinians uh, 
uh, want to fight with Israel over their situation, it still serves Iran's interest and, uh, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily uh, detract that much from the uh, deterrence of the axis of resistance. Let's talk uh, for a minute about um, how uh, the Houthis or whomever and get their weapons from Iran. You know, there's, I mean, how, how does this smuggling take place you know, how are they able to, let, what let networks are they leveraging transportation? I know we've, ships have been seized with these weapons in the past, of course, but what other um, uh, means do they have to get them these weapons? Uh, it, it is mostly shipping. Uh, we know because uh, the U.S. Navy's intercepted a lot of ships uh, that uh, they just uh, come down uh, in uh, dows and other vessels, uh, uh, out of the strait and, and around Oman and, and uh, you know, drop off their materials in various places where they make their way to uh, the Houthis. Um, with the Hamas, for example, uh, the Iranians were sending stuff to Sudan and then uh, Bedouins uh, would uh, transport it up through the Sinai and then they would smuggle it into uh, uh, Gaza through tunnels. Sometimes they would hide it in other goods that were coming in. Um, uh, Hezbollah would get goods into Gaza by again going out to sea and they would uh, put stuff in uh, barrels that floated and uh, they would drop the barrels off into the Mediterranean and Palestinian fishermen would pick them up and take them uh, into Gaza. Uh, Lebanon and Iraq and Syria uh, right now seems to be all land transport. Uh, basically the Iranians can drive from uh, the Iranian border across Iraq and to Syria and, and to Lebanon to deliver stuff. Although they also use air transport and, uh, and, and uh, I would throw out their operational security apparently is really bad because uh, part of the Israeli war between the wars over the past few years is that uh, they regularly bomb Syrian airfields uh, where the Iranians are moving equipment and, and, and material around. Uh, um, to uh, try and reduce the flow of uh, weapons and stuff to Hezbollah. And the Iranians seem to just take that. Uh, they have. That's, uh, you know, again, that's one of those things when you talk about, you know, uh, how much uh, Iran is trying to assert its hegemony is that uh, uh, for years now, they've just kind of taken the occasional Israeli bombing, the loss of personnel, including some high-ranking IRGC uh, Quds Force officers, uh, as just a cost of doing business. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of encapsulate a couple questions here, but I think it's get, uh, some people are getting at this. Um, do we see um, this escalating with Hezbollah? I mean, we we just saw we get right in right in their kitchen uh, the Is Israelis uh, knocked out an important uh, Hamas leader, and uh, you know, is do we think I, you mentioned that? Um, Hezbollah seems very reluctant to have anything like a reprise of 2006 happening again. Um, what would you see could be, what, what would be the red line then uh, for this to escalate? Uh, well, you know, that, again, that's why I think it's an unknown. Uh, yeah. they've, they've made a lot of red lines that have been bypassed. Uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, there was a Quds Force officer who was killed in Damascus in December. Uh, the Hezbollah has lost a couple of commanders, uh, some other top leaders. Um, the, the Houthi leadership, even they complained when the Quds Force officer was killed that Iran's response was so weak that uh, they even accused the Iranians of risking to appear fearful, uh, which you know, kind of a mean thing to say. Uh, but uh, the uh, I think all those things basically show is that uh, Iran wants to keep the its deterrent intact. It's not willing to sacrifice it for Hamas. And that's probably going to hold true for a while. Uh, it's possible that, you know, uh, as I was when I was talking about unknown unknowns, that, you know, it could be that at some point uh, they do feel a need to respond. Uh, but uh, I, ju I just don't see that happening. Uh, you know, barring some real horrible tragedy. And, and I can't think of a good uh, um, example of, of some kind of uh, 
previous event where the Iranians decided to go all in because of something that happened to one of its Axis members. I, you know, even talking about 2006, uh, Hezbollah came out of that pretty well, although they suffered a lot of destruction and losses. Um, and Iran helped them rebuild, but at the time, most of its support was was just rhetoric, and, and I think that maintained. So that's kind of the good news. Now, uh, there are a lot of things that could happen. There, are, uh, The Israelis could go after Hezbollah in such a way that uh, Iran felt it had to respond. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's possible uh, the Houthis could do something that uh, causes that war to flare back up. And again, Iranians might feel a a need to uh, uh, try to put pressure on the Gulf Arabs on the Persian Gulf front to help out the Houthis. So uh, I think the war could still expand. It's just there are there does appear to be some limits to it. Here's an interest here. So speaking about out of the box questions, okay. So um, Stephanie asks about a uh, potential Iran influence within the Israeli body politic. Is there, do we have any sense of, do they have any influence with small parties in Israel? Um, would uh, they, would these parties be susceptible to influence? Um, and what would they see as a good political outcome in Israel? Um, that's a good question. I'm not aware of them having any political influence. Uh, they are active on the cyber front. So, uh, you know, possibly they're out in Israeli social media trying to stir up the divisions that already exist in Israeli society. Uh, I think they might be taking the stance of, uh, you know, don't get in the way when your enemy's uh, uh, harming itself. And, and, you know, right now the divisions in Israeli society would seem to be doing a lot of that work for Tehran. Uh, uh, right now, I, I think they're just emphasizing trying to build up their own reputation with uh, the Muslim world and the global South as, uh, you know, we are the defenders of the oppressed. We are taking on the West and, and its unfairness and, and all its actions. And, uh, um, and, you know, they'll pocket those gains. All right. Some, a uh, few more questions, uh, folks. We have about five minutes left. Thanks for all these great questions. And thanks Steve for uh, your answers to them. Uh, one of the things, I mean, here's a question It's out of the box for a little bit of, and maybe out of the lane for, you know, former intelligence officers to talk about this, but what about U S red lines to the IRGC? We talked about, um, you know, their, you know, what they've been involved in. Uh, we didn't, we, I don't think we've mentioned the word terrorism in this so far. But of course, they've been involved in uh, some very prominent terrorist acts, even against U against U.S. interests in the '90s. Um, what and uh, you know, of course, uh, the Argentina uh, embassy bombing '92. Uh, uh, could we see this as something that uh, starts up again? Uh, presumably, that would be a red line. Uh, any thoughts on this? Um. Uh a red line for the U.S. taking action against taking direct action, perhaps like we did in 2020. Yeah, uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, um, it, it's certainly the threat is out there and it's been there for a while. Uh, the Iranians, because of the, the the 2020 thing you're referring to is uh, the, the drone attack that killed uh, Qasem Soleimani. Yes. Uh, you know, after that, the Iranians basically put out a death sentence on a number of uh, U.S. officials, including the president, and the secretary of state uh, and some of the military uh, officers involved in that attack. Uh, uh, we know because uh, the U.S. government says from time to time that those threats are still active and that uh, we're doing our best to protect uh, our, our people uh, and, and warn of consequences. So I think that is a red line. Uh, but um, uh, over the years, it, it's kind of come down in a lot of instances to where, you know, again, as part of the, the overall conflict, both of us, uh, both sides are willing to accept some losses as a cost of doing business. Uh, thing I like to remind people, and, and again, I hope I don't come off as uh, 
pro-Iranian. I'm not. I've, I've spent most of my career working against them. Uh, but, uh, you know, from Iranian perspective, it's like, you know, for every complaint we make about terrorism and, and Iranian malign activities is that, you know, inside their country themselves, they have the same complaint that they think that the United States and its other adversaries have uh, supported various uh, uh, anti-regime ethnic groups that uh, conducted violent attacks, what we call terrorism. Uh, certainly uh, the Israelis uh, have uh, run operations that killed uh, Iranian scientists in downtown Tehran, which, you know, if you kind of flip that script and said, what if an Iranian killed an American scientist in downtown Washington, you know, how terrible that would be and how provocative. But uh, the Iranians have done all of that. They try to retaliate uh, and they usually fail. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the environment they're in where both sides as part of this ongoing conflict. Uh, you know, they're trying to keep it a cold war instead of a hot war. And, uh, you know, some of these things are just, uh, as I said, are kind of the cost of doing business. Trying to process a couple last questions here. Uh, yeah. Okay, the um, uh, do we see this getting out of hand where Iran would start distancing itself from some of these members in the axis of resistance? Um, I mean, plausible deniability, of course, has been part of their MO on this. Uh, uh, could they be, you know, could they start walking back from perhaps to excessive actions? Um. I don't, you know, honestly, I don't think so. Uh, um, uh, when you think of, uh, I mean, just as an example, uh, uh, admittedly, this was while the U.S. was still occupying Iraq, but uh, uh, the fight between the, the various Shia and Sunni militias in Iraq was incredibly nasty. I mean, there were, uh, you know, not only just the killings, but the brutality of some of the killings and the torture and stuff that went on by both sides, uh, uh, the, you know, the Iranians never really shied away from that. And, uh, and, and uh, although they aren't part of the axis of resistance, uh, you know, when the Iranians were supporting uh, the Taliban and, and, and others against the United States uh, when we were in Afghanistan, is that uh, they supported some pretty bad actors and, you know, they didn't shy away from that to, uh, to, to, to meet their objectives, which was to try to get the U.S. out. So they have a pretty high threshold. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember now. I think they were critical when Assad used chemical weapons just because in general they, based on their own experience during the Iran-Iraq war, was critical of chemical weapons use. Uh, but they didn't stop supporting them. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Joseph, uh, the question about whether our red lines on the, uh, you know, attacks in the Red Sea you know, just as a former naval officer, I think we've got this so far. You know, it seems like we're man. It seems like the fleet's managing this pretty well. I would be shocked if we did anything that would um, more retaliatory. Perhaps maybe a strike inland on a at an obvious missile site, but there doesn't seem to be anything we can't handle. They're not hitting very much. Uh, the shipping, a lot of uh, the ship, I was just looking at the data and uh, on shipping through the Red Sea, it's not been affected terribly much. So some there's some ship lines have been making, uh, have been rerouting, but uh, otherwise, um, this looks like something the fleet can handle. It's good practice for them. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't have, uh, the Navy hasn't had as often, uh, as much opportunities as the Army has in more recent years. So, so anyway, uh, it's, it's, um, now at top of the hour, and uh, I want to thank our guest, uh, Stephen Ward, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's a great overview on uh, the IRGC, the acts of resistance, really insightful on Iran and its uh, its strategic culture, I think, its strategic objectives. And um, thanks again, Steve, and, really, and good luck with your, uh, his, uh, the, your historical research. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody. We're going to have some more uh, inside intelligence coming throughout 2024. Uh, we look forward to uh, putting those announcements out to you. Uh, keep watching for them. And uh, for that, uh, this is Michael Lord, and uh, we'll see you next time.